Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Fellowship Series here on the AOC PMNR podcast. I'm Chanel Davidoff, and I'm here with Jake Agat, and we'll be your host for the show today. For those of you new to the podcast, in this series, we're going to sit with current and recently graduated PMNR fellows and chat with them about their journey to fellowship and unique career paths. You can also expect some insight into their program and key tips and advice on how to pursue your dream fellowship. So uh, today we have a really special guest on the show. He's a spinal cord injury fellow at Kessler Rehab Institute in New Jersey. I want to welcome Dr. John Lopez. Welcome to the show. Hi there. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Definitely. So first and foremost, let's just uh, go straight to introduction. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, how you got into PM&R. Yep. Uh, I grew up in Maryland, um, spent my whole life there until I went to college and then ended up going to LSU, go Tigers. <laughs> and then uh, after that, I, I moved to Arizona where I did medical school at Midwestern University. That's a DO program in Glendale, Arizona. Loved Arizona. It's awesome out there. But then um, happened across PM&R um, and ended up going to um, University of Kentucky for my residency. That was, that was my top choice for that. And then knew I was pretty interested in spinal cord from kind of from the beginning and then um, did the spinal cord medicine fellowship application and was fortunate enough to match at uh, Kessler Kessler Rehab. But as far as how I ended up with PM&R, I, I, like I said, I kind of always knew I liked neuroanatomy and spinal cord injury. And after realizing that, you know, neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery weren't my career aspirations, I uh, kind of randomly came across PM&R. I, I thought neurology is who managed everything that PM&R does, but quickly found out <laughs> that that's not the case. So a quick Google search of some of the things that PM&R does led me to PM&R. I wanted to ask you about that too, uh, from like the medical school or medical student standpoint. Um, my my younger brother is interested in neurology because he likes neuroscience and he's he's starting medical school this next fall. And I keep telling him PM&R is actually as much neurology, it seems like, as neurology. And so when you were kind of comparing and contrasting, can you like elaborate a little? What made you lean towards more PM&R? And really, what is like the distinction between neurology and PM&R if, you, if you're both handling like spinal cord injuries and, and brain issues, all the neuroanatomies there? What is the difference really like there? Yeah, so I think um, the biggest difference is and this is very general, is neurology focus more, more focused on diagnostics, getting to the diagnosis and treating the, the acute process, whatever it may be, stroke, um, the, the multiple sclerosis. But physiatry and rehab medicine focuses more on after that acute hospitalization. What's the long-term repercussions of the injury or the diagnosis? So it looks more at functional recovery, not necessarily getting you back to how things were, but, but living with the, some of the deficits you may have, but living a fulfilling life. So that's, that's kind of how they differ. When I was um, kind of deciding between the two, I mean, I never really had that much of an interest in neurology per se. Um, I liked the breadth, like the variety of topics that PM&R looked at, you know, not just the neurodiagnoses, but musculoskeletal medicine, um, amputation and prosthetics, electrodiagnostics, and a whole bunch of pain procedures. So the, the wide variety of things that PM&R had to offer was kind of what helped me distinguish between the two. Yeah, like I said, the biggest difference is focusing on functional recovery is what separates PM&R from neurology. Not that, not that that's one's better or, or worse. But it just has more other topics that you're interested in. It's not just the yeah. brain, it can, it can be musculoskeletal. There's just more for you to do and get your hands on. Exactly. And I was really interested and still am in amputation and prosthetics. And that's definitely not something that falls under the uh, neurology umbrella. And I don't like seizures, so kind of worked out. But you do run into that every now and then, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. yeah, I encounter seizures and have to manage it, but um, right. go along, you know. Right. It's it's interesting because PM&R just extends into so many different fields. So, um, But you have kind of a similar story to... Uh, um, a lot of fellows, uh, when I ask them about their path to PM&R, you know, it's kind of like thinking neurology, thinking sports, um, ended up doing a Google search, found PM&R, it found me, it was just, um, that's it from here on out. So, 
Yeah, but it sounded like you were, um, it, you mentioned neurosurgery. Um, were you, are you a procedural person? And is that something that you, you try to pursue as well? Yeah, so now I enjoy procedures. Um, those procedures mainly being um, ultrasound guided peripheral joint injections. But at, at the time when I was considering neurosurgery and orthopedic spine surgery, it had more to do with me just knowing that I was really intrigued by um, the spinal cord and the spinal column. And I just thought uh, that that would be the best way for me to help people who, who undergo spinal cord injuries. Um, and they are a huge help. I think the other reason I went into PM&R, one of the things that distinguishes it is kind of this lifelong relationship we have with the patient. Um, whereas after an intervention or a surgery, you, you know, you kind of have a few follow-ups and they, the surgeon impacts your life greatly, but you don't really develop long-term bonds with the patient because with a spinal cord patient, you'll, you know, assuming you both live in the same area, that's your patient and you're their physician until you guys move on, however that might be, whether it be moving locations, passing away, but there's there's life lifelong needs that the rehab population needs, and I kind of wanted to be along for the, the long-term ride. And it seems like, you know, in the future or even now, both integrating and working together, having that interprofessional relationship, and it's kind of like, what side of, do you want to be on? You know, what was what was residency like for you? I mean, you sounds like you were always interested in spinal cord medicine, but was there a moment where you kind of doubted it and you were thinking something else? Well, it's it's kind of funny because I didn't I didn't looking back I didn't know I wanted to do spinal cord I just knew that I thought it was really interesting and my favorite thing to learn in medical school was was neuroanatomy um, so when I got to residency and like looking back and reading my personal statements for med school mm -hmm. and subsequently residency I talked about my interest in spinal cord medicine so when I went into residency you know it was it was always in the forefront as as to what I wanted to do I kind of went into it not just with an open mind but tried to convince myself to not do spinal cord medicine I was just worried that I would float through and maybe not focus on some of the other aspects of PM&R that are awesome and, and there were definitely times where I like the first few weeks of my brain injury rotation I have an awesome brain injury attending Dr. Key at University of Kentucky and I thought for the first couple weeks I was like you know what I'm gonna make the switch. I want to do brain injury. <laughs> then I saw another spinal cord injury patient, outpatient. And I was like, oh, never mind. That's that's what I like. So there, I mean, there were definitely things that not made me second guess, but just there's so many things in PM&R that are fun and exciting. And so some advice to like any students would be keep keep an open mind because even though I went into it wholeheartedly wanting to do spinal cord injury, there were definitely times where I thought, you know what, being an electrodiagnostician, that, that's I could do that too. So for me, most people I know go into PM&R with one idea and then over the course of time get introduced to new things and they, they do end up changing. Most of the people in our program um, followed that path. For me, I just, I don't know, I liked it then and I like it even more now, spinal cord medicine. I just wanted to ask you, this is something that I think a lot about on my rotations right now. And like my last rotation was general surgery and we did a lot of trauma and I was thinking, Trauma's awesome. Trauma's cool. This is exciting. And I told that to my preceptor and he said, well, it is exciting, but you know, sometimes there's a trauma that's like a young child who's get gets hit by a car or gets run over by their parent or something. And that's not fun for anyone. Like that's a horrible experience for everyone involved and someone's got to do it. And so that just made me really think about what kind of like patient population will I be treating and, and whatever I do in the future. And is that something that I want to see regularly? And when I think about spinal cord injury, I can kind of see it two ways. I, I could see maybe it, it's this incredibly rewarding thing to help people deal with their problems and overcome them. And like you said, not go back to normal, but to like learn how to live a life again. I could see that being very rewarding. And I could also imagine it being very taxing if, if someone is just devastated by their own injury and they they feel like they're never going to recover. And I could see that being like just very emotionally hard to, to help people like that and so what is that like um, treating spinal cord injury patients like is it a mix of both is it you just have to have the right personality for it or is it just it's awesome all the time you feel like you're constantly helping people yeah that's a great question um you know there there are times it is hard no question about it i've been in doing the fellowship for two months now and approximately half or slightly more of the patients that we admit on the inpatient side have a spinal cord injury that the attending see other patients you know keep a variety but it is it is hard you see three or four new spinal cord admissions in a day and they're all young 
the initial stories kind of like take you aback and you have to kind of look at it from a different perspective. You know, I always try and just remember that the patient I'm seeing is a person and that person is scared and probably worried, frustrated, alone, all the, all the synonyms that go along with that. And I, I try and um, remove the side that makes you sad, at least when I'm with them. Show them that there's good to come out of this, right? Show them that there's other patients in the hospital that get better. There's, there's, there's life after this. So I think, you know, if you let it get to you, the day in and day out of seeing something sad, it, it will get to you. So you know, having a support system in your own life is important to vent, let others who care about you know the situation. But it, it's not all bad, right? right. You know, it you, sounds very rewarding overall, yeah, it, um, you know, helping someone to get to a, a point where they can have a little bit of function and quality yeah. of life, you know. For anybody going into spinal cord medicine, you need to recognize that when you walk in the room to see the patient, like for the first time or every day, you, you get to walk out. And uh, it's just really, really uh, imperative to remember that that person, not just that patient, but that person is like going through it. And if you can connect with them on a, a human level, an emotional level, you can get plenty of reward. Because mm -hmm. um, a lot of patients, even if they have high level cervical spinal cord injuries, um, there's a lot of research that shows those patients live extremely fulfilling lives. Some of them say they feel more fulfilled after their injury um, than beforehand because you know they get a new social network and they realize how much people care and so yeah it's tough to balance but I think um, you got to take the good with the bad <laughs> yeah and, and I think that that's the same for all aspects of medicine I mean I haven't been on a rotation yet where I haven't seen someone who's like dying of cancer and, and everyone needs help you know and everyone's scared and we're in medicine because we're empathetic people and we want to help people you know and I mean one thing that I, I imagine is unique about like a spinal cord injury is like, yes, people are injured, but yes, they're still alive. And yes, there's still like this amazing capacity for, for more living to do. And if you're in something like like pancreatic cancer, like there maybe isn't a whole lot of life left. And so I think getting people to turn the corner like that and seeing like all the, the hope that they, they can develop, like I got to imagine that's got to be one of the most rewarding things you do. Well, it's just what's so rewarding is that, you know, spinal cord medicine is a, is a team effort. It's not just the doctors, not just the physician, you know, the nursing staff is pivotal in helping the patient. The the techs, the nursing techs who help position and and change the patient is pivotal. And then you have the therapy team and seeing how everyone kind of comes together, the psychology team mm -hmm. uh, and and support the patient, that is rewarding. You know, and I, I think uh, oftentimes that uh, whole team effort, the patient realizes, wow, you know, I'm going through a, a tough situation, but all these people are here for me. Usually, you know, in the short time I've been doing this, usually um, during the inpatient stay, most patients kind of turn this corner where they maybe have some improvements, <clears throat> maybe learn some new skills, and then their mentality also changes. And they say, you know what, I'm going to do whatever their goal is. I'm going to do something. I'm going to reach my goal. And that's, that's fun to see, especially because then everyone gets to celebrate and all the therapists and nurses and psychologists, the whole team. So that's what I like about PM&R and, <clears throat> and spinal cord medicine is the team focus. And it sounds like there's stages, just like, you know, with a cancer patient, there's different stages to their care, pre-diagnosis, post-diagnosis, and the whole continuum. It sounds like spinal cord injury is similar, kind of right after the trauma, their acute rehab stay, um, and then ongoing afterwards, their recovery is not short it's it's lifelong, lifelong essentially yeah. so that's really nice that you kind of get to see them on that whole continuum of care so just dialing it back a little bit do you do you do you think it's important to have a mentor in residency when you're thinking about fellowship yeah i mean most programs end up for lack of a better word assigning you a mentor for me i was fortunate enough to have multiple mentors um at the university of kentucky there was our spinal cord injury attending dr salas who i met during my residency interview and she just from the interview played a enormous role in my decision to want to train there having someone who can help you navigate um the field that you're interested in is important but I, I think for me like i said i was fortunate enough to have multiple mentors i had the spinal cord mentor i had a research mentor but then i had just like a, a life medicine mentor and you know they all play a different role and i think i think it's important to 
seek out people you're close with in medicine, like seek out your attendings and, and just have open discussions with them. Say, look, I'm interested in this topic. You're great at this topic. What are your thoughts? Do you think you can help me out? And I mean, in my experience at two different programs now, like everyone in PM&R is open and receptive to guiding, teaching, mentoring, all of those things. So I, I definitely think having a mentor is important, really, really yeah. important. That's really insightful. That's really good. Having someone there to kind of help you focus on really what you're good at and what you're passionate about and find that intersection and really like push you towards where your potential is. So what, what are some opportunities that you got involved with uh, in residency that kind of helped you to apply for Spinal Cord Injury Fellowship? You know, when you think of other fellowships like uh, interventional pain, those are that's and sports medicine those are those are very competitive fellowships just from a number standpoint like not everybody who applies gets it for spinal cord it's slightly different um there are more positions than there are applicants it's less competitive in the sense of matching but it's very competitive at like the top six or so programs however many programs you want to consider the top so i think getting access to opportunities to showcase yourself early on is is helpful i was fortunate enough to partake in a lot of things early on that maybe not everyone had the opportunity for. So for a resident applying for a spinal cord injury fellowship, I think doing the AAP conference or AAP MNR, doing a case report there and a poster presentation there affords you an opportunity to meet, network and meet people you wouldn't meet. That initial meeting can open up avenues at future conferences. Oh, you were the resident that gave the talk on spinal cord. I met you. So people, I would, I would advise residents to try and get a case report at one of those larger conferences. Those types of opportunities really, really helped me meet everyone in the field and I feel like have a, um, like a strong interview season. It wasn't, my interviews weren't the first time meeting people. We could talk about interesting research I did or something on my CV and not trying to get to know someone. I already kind of knew them. Trying to be, partake in some of the conferences I thought was the best way to build an application. Um, I, I was curious about being a spinal cord injury fellow, and I guess beyond once you finished your fellowship, how much does it change your day-to-day -day practice? Like I, I've kind of learned that with like sports medicine, you're, you're going to only be doing sports medicine stuff 20% of the time or something, and the rest of it you'll still be doing general PM&R sort of work. Um, after doing like a spinal cord injury, are you doing like all spinal cord injury work or how, how much of spinal cord injury do you see in your day-to-day -day practice now? Is it all you do? Is it just still a fraction? So the, it's kind of, so it's while you're in fellowship, it's kind of fellowship dependent. Um, at my, at Kessler and Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, we, um, the inpatient services are approximately 50% spinal cord injury uh, mixed with other diagnoses. Like it could be multiple sclerosis, it could be general orthopedic things like pelvic and femur fractures, but about half the inpatients are um, spinal cord. The majority or if not all of the outpatients that I am currently seeing with the attendings and in my own continuity clinic are spinal cord injury patients. And then the rest of the topics are usually just spasticity management. So at Kessler you do um, weekly spasticity clinics with high levels of botulinum toxin injection and difficult um, spasticity management patients. And those are a mix of stroke, brain injury, spinal cord injury. And then the same goes uh, for weekly inpatient spasticity rounds. Those are a mix. So for in fellowship, I think it's very program dependent. I did interview at other programs where the inpatient services had um, a cap like the cap would be 10 patients and they were only seeing spinal cord patients. As far as how it changes after that, I mean, I, like out of fellowship, it's kind of dependent on what you want. I mean, a lot of the attendings I've talked to at, you know, multiple programs say, maybe they're not, maybe they don't want to do 100% spinal cord injury. Not that just because they want to keep their skills up in other arenas and, right. um, I do know like if you, if you pursue spinal cord medicine at the VA, you could very well have a near 100% SCI based practice. So it's kind of how much you want after fellowship. And then within the fellowships, I think it is fairly fellowship dependent, but I doubt it's all, I doubt any program is, you know, 
100% SCI fellowship training. Yeah, it sounds like all these programs, spinal cord programs, are, are very, very diverse, very different. What were you looking for when you were applying? And did you always kind of have Kessler on your mind as you're applying? I mean, it's a big name, not going to lie. So um, was it on your radar or were you kind of still looking around? And what was your kind of criteria with fellowship? I did have Kessler uh, pretty high on my list. I, I was fortunate enough to meet the fellowship program director, Dr. Kirschblum, very early on in my training at um, the AAP conference, my second, my PGY2 year. And that initial meeting and hearing him speak and I mean, everything he brings to the table always stuck with me, right? It was always high on my list that I wanted to train with him. But an easy way to kind of think about it is um, breaking it down into VA-based or non-VA-based. I sought out the non-VA programs primarily because I was exposed to a lot of time at the VA in my residency and wanted to focus more on <clears throat> typical insurance than VA life. A after that, I was really looking for what programs gave you the most opportunities. Could you do inpatient, outpatient, urodynamics, spasticity, intrathecal backlift and pump trials, um, pediatrics, VA if you wanted it. Like what, what covered all the bases? Kessler definitely falls into that category. Uh, the next kind of most important thing I looked at was what programs give you the opportunity to decide your year, like your schedule. Some programs have, they say, here's your 12 month schedule. Whereas other programs say, well, we don't really have a schedule. It's kind of what you want to do. And I loved the opportunity to kind of guide my own training. I think it's important after you settle on a job and get hired to train for that job. You know, if you're going into academic medicine, it is helpful to be on a service with a resident so you can, in fellowship, so you can serve in like the junior attending role and learn how to teach and, and be an attending. Those were kind of the biggest things. I did look at location. I, I did think of location. East um, Coast, really? East Coast, <laughs> All <know>. the way <laughs> I know. from I the West. Ready. I was ready to come back. <laughs> Good. So location was a big thing, but I think there are a few multiple programs that when people say, yeah, I want to do spinal cord medicine, there's a few um, you know names that stand out to them. And I, I, I applied to a lot of programs. And like I said, there's a lot of great programs, but knowing Dr. Kirschblum, I knew I wanted to train with him. You know, Kessler being on the East Coast was like the perfect location for me. And then um, Kessler itself allowing you to guide and build your own schedule with an, a variety and plethora of topics within Spinal Cord was kind of sealed the deal, kind of sealed the deal for me. Um, I, I have a question about that also, Dr. Lopez. Um, how much does it matter where you go to residency for getting a job? And how much does it matter for where you? do a fellowship for getting a job like if you go to Kessler or, or like a, a big name institution like that do you think that like opens up more doors if you wanted to work somewhere that was like a more competitive job so I don't know if people intentionally um, let your residency training location infiltrate their decision making but I think there are some biases that exist right everyone thinks of these certain programs that are the, the big six or whatever the term is that gets thrown around the student doctor network. Um, if you're a good person and you show objective evidence of that in your training and you work hard, you know, you're gonna get the opportunities you want. So for fellowship, I did a lot of extracurricular things that went on my CV to really make myself a strong candidate. So I can't say for sure how much it influences like where you train and how it impacts you in the future. But I do know for me, it felt like I was at a disadvantage sometimes. But I would, I would have even kind of thought of it in a different light because you can kind of spin it in a way where, you know, I wasn't getting the exposure that I wanted to in order to pursue my career as a spinal cord injury doc. I'm here, I'm looking for something different, something more, more mentorship, more exposure, you know, because in the Northeast, there's a whole lot of exposure and I'm sure it's very different than being in Kentucky. I personally wouldn't think that where you're from, even if it's not a big name, um, would be a hindrance to, to landing a, a big fellowship. You know? Right. And I, and I hope for people it doesn't, I hope it never comes to that because medicine, I mean, life is all about what you, 
what do you put into it? You can you can have great scores and match with this great program, but if you're not a good person and you don't go above and beyond, it doesn't matter what name you have next to your program. Like your letters are going to reflect that, your interview style is going to reflect that, your 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 CV is going to reflect that. If you are nice to people and like put your best foot forward. Cat, I have a cat. <laughs> you were just noticing. That. For everyone listening on audio, there is now a cat in the background. A, a, a very lovely cat. What is your cat's name? This is this is Mocha. Oh, right. Mocha. This is this is great footage. This is staying. <laughs> Mocha is joining us on the podcast as well. Uh, yeah. But it doesn't matter the name next year program. People will appreciate the hard work and recognize and recognize. And now, as far as like fellowship goes, I don't think. Um, me having <clears throat> what's perceived as a great fellowship um, as as part of my resume. I don't think that's going to affect my job opportunities per se, but this current fellowship um, has networking opportunities that might expose me to jobs I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily be privy to. So that's not to say the fellowship is getting me a better job, but the opportunities might be better, if that makes sense. I'm gonna echo what you said, uh, Dr. Lopez, just because that networking piece, I think is is really valuable. Um, I know from talking from other fellows, the way they, they said that they ended up at their top choice fellowship was putting themselves out there at uh, conferences. Um, so it sounds like that's something that you did and something that probably uh, benefited you. Um, but I have to ask, you know, how did you just go up to Dr. Kushbloom and just say, hey, you know, you don't know me, but I know you. And You just got to shoot your shot or something. I lucked out. What was that like? I lucked out. So he was doing a presentation at the AAP conference. It was my second year in 2018. We were in Georgia, and the presentation he often gives is difficult to diagnose Insky cases, the spinal cord exam. Um, so he puts up a projector and everyone gets a clicker and you buzz in and uh the guy next to me his battery or his clicker wasn't working like the battery was dead or something and he's like oh man my clicker's not working i said well like just go get a new one and he's like no no like i don't want to go up there i'll be embarrassed and i was like i'll do it i guess he had to like walk up in front of everybody and ask dr kirschman for a clicker so I, I walked up to the front of the auditorium before the lecture started and waved my clicker in insinuating it wasn't working so dr kirschman acknowledged me and threw me a clicker you know we're like 10 or 15 feet away like tosses me a clicker and i caught it i don't know like a, a normal human being that was the beginning of a great relationship <laughs> that was, right there was like oh you caught it like that's so cool so fast forward the lecture happens no big deal later that night like two hours later there was a fellowship and job fair that major conferences always have and i walked in and there was a, a kessler rehab desk and um, the, the coordinator kind of setting it up said, oh, hi, like, what are you interested in? I said, spinal cord medicine. She said, oh, you have to meet Dr. Kirschblum. So she brought him over and he was like, oh, you caught it. You caught the clicker. <laughs> the that, clicker story. That, yeah, that, has, that led to um, a long conversation. And then we met at another conference and then he presented in Kentucky and we sat down for an hour and I ended up emailing him about spinal cord questions and asking for help with presentations. And over the course of you know two and a half or three years, I felt like we had a, a very strong professional relationship prior to even uh, you know starting fellowship. So I, I locked out, I mean, he is, he is approachable. Many of the SCI fellowship directors are approachable. So my advice would be just go talk to them. They stand at these fellowship fair booths for a reason. They're there to meet you. They're not there, like they're not getting paid to be there, I promise. So just go up to people and say, hey, I'm so-and-so and I like spinal cord medicine, thinking about doing a fellowship. People will appreciate it and it will open up doors that I didn't even foresee being options for me. So moral of the story is put yourself out there and learn to catch a clicker. That's it, those are the okay. two things. <laughs> those are the two things. Yeah. <laughs> and show up for conferences. <laughs> yeah, do the conferences. And at, at these conferences, while we're on this topic, for spinal cord medicine, does everyone kind of know each other in the field or is it pretty big? Like when you were applying, did you feel like you knew everyone on your interview trail? Oh yeah, I. Um, okay. what I found interesting was that I already knew 
all the past year's fellows. Like I, I would meet them at um, lectures or breakfast in the morning. I'd say, hey, um, like, aren't you? Didn't you do your fellowship last year? And I learned an enormous amount about the programs before going to the interviews. You know, the the previous fellows would talk about things that maybe you didn't want to ask on your interview, so to say. So, yeah, it's a it's a it's a small specialty, and it's definitely a close knit group. I mean, if I mention someone's name, all the all the attendings at Kessler are like, oh yeah, I know John, or like, oh yeah, Sally, she's great. You know, everyone at least knows of each other, if not knows each other personally so what what has been i mean i know you've been a fellow for a couple months now so what has been the most challenging thing uh, about being a fellow that you found when you started i know you're in this new era <laughs> of fellowship after covid so tell us a little bit about what are the most challenging things that you're facing and how has covid affected your fellowship training so far i think the most difficult thing for someone who's coming from a, one institution to another is just learning like a brand new hospital system. And it's different from intern year because no one expects anything of you like intern year. And they might expect you to do a lot of work, but people expect that you know you might not know all the medical knowledge. Whereas in fellowship, I could be serving in an attending role right now. So people expect you to know stuff and when you don't know how to log into the computer or what a nurse's name is, it can be a challenge to feel like you know stuff, to convince yourself that, you know what, I am um, I am knowledgeable. So just the transition from one location to another um, is somewhat of a challenge. With, with that being said, the other challenge is learning to serve the quote unquote fellowship role, you know, being a mentor to the current residents who I don't who I didn't know two months ago. You know, it's not like I'm a fourth year there who's known the residents for three years and I'm, <clears throat> they trust me. I'm this new guy who, I'm the only new person in the program and they're just supposed to like take what I say as advice. So trying to quickly develop relationships is a challenge, but it's been easy. And that's, that is uh, a testament to the, the folks at Kessler. They're a great resident group and everyone has been more than accommodating and very welcoming. So those have been some of the challenges. I think the other challenge is just managing expectations. I think, you know, uh, Jake, you touched on it earlier, like what percentage of patients are SCI? You know, you, th you go into fellowship thinking, gosh, every I'm gonna do 100% spinal cord injury. Everything I do is I'm gonna be engrossed in spinal cord injury. And no matter where you go, that, that just isn't the case. There, there are many, many patients that need to be seen so just managing the expectations and realizing if you go some time frame without it being all spinal cord injury, um, not letting that frustrate you is is a very important thing in any in any fellowship. You know you have to manage your expectations and know that PM&R is a diverse field and you should be a well-rounded physician. As far as COVID goes, um, unfortunately, New Jersey was. Um, very heavily hit uh, with with COVID early on, and that impacted a lot of the residents significantly at Kessler. Since I have been here, um, number of cases have been down. Hospitalizations are the lowest they've been since like um, April. So the impact is not nearly as prevalent. Some of the things that have changed. I mean, the typical daily screening stuff that doesn't really affect my training but what has altered training is um, doing virtual outpatient visits at Kessler they're kind of some in some in-person visits and some virtual so just learning like how to interact with people patients on a virtual basis has been a, a change I think it's going to benefit spinal cord medicine because not every patient has the access and the transportation to come to these visits. So being able to see someone virtually and, and manage their problems remotely, uh, I think will benefit spinal cord medicine. But outside of that, uh, I don't think my training has been significantly impacted, although we still do see a, a fair amount of COVID recovery patients. And to be honest, some of them who have critical illness polyneuropathy behave like spinal cord injury patients. They have functional tetraplegia and are extremely weak 
the goal is to manage the patient as best you can and do what's best for them. But if you also look at it from a, okay, what would I do for a spinal cord injury? You know, protecting skin, managing orthostatic hypotension, writing physical therapy prescriptions. Um, there are learning opportunities in those patients as long as you, you know, put the patient first and second, patient first, patient second, and then, um, you know, find ways to relate it to the field of interest. I think there are learning opportunities, but I, I don't feel like my training has been negatively impacted. I wish I could go to the conferences, um, like spinal cord conferences. Um, that's kind of the thing that has been impacted the most is the conferences will be done virtually. And I have a, um, a podium presentation that I was excited about that I'll be doing virtually. And um, I don't have the opportunity to necessarily seek out job opportunities, but that's all right. Uh, th that's really interesting what you said about uh, how like your expertise in like a spinal cord injury would be beneficial for someone who doesn't even have a spinal cord injury, but like a COVID patient who has all the kind of very similar symptoms. Because I imagine like that's something I hadn't thought of before. And I imagine there's like a huge potential for um, like someone SCI trained to to like step up and do a lot of good work. Do people know about that or am I just not listening in the right circles? <laughs> No, I don't know, man. I can't say like what it is nationally, but I know at um, at Kessler, from what I can see, the majority of the COVID recovery patients do do go to those attendings who are spinal cord trained. Now, some of the other side effects of COVID being hypoxia and anoxic brain injury and strokes, you know, those patients go to the brain injury attendings. But but folks who have respiratory failure and tetraplegia um yeah the, they have been managed by the spinal cord folks and i i think the attendings at kessler dr nieves dr lamb dr benevento um are probably well equipped more so than some others you know non-sci folks to take care of them it's an inter it's an interesting strategy if you think about it because it's just really the principles of spinal cord medicine right like you yeah. you've dealt you've dealt with vented patients similar to the ones um post covid um weeding them off their they're decannulating their trachs um okay. you know have to deal with the feeding and all of these things skin um turning them in bed to prevent pressure injuries um they have probably dysautonomia and oh, yeah. and 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 stuff like that so that that's a really interesting point and it sounds like you're trying to make the most of your fellowship when you do get these patients to to apply those principles yeah and i think i mean that's you, know, you bring up a good point. There is learning in every patient. So advice for anybody listening, like, you can learn something from their care. There are patients that need help and I'm gonna help them. And there is true value in, in my education and my training in helping them. So yeah, just trying to make the most, the most of each patient um, regardless of level of training, med school, residency, you know, lifelong learning, you should really try and find something from each patient that you can use in the future. With spinal cord injury um, physicians, right? From what I've learned rotating as a resident in the SEI clinic, you're, you're functioning as kind of a primary care physician for these patients. And I found that super interesting. And one of the really good qualities about um, spinal cord injury is you're a specialist, but you are the specialist for this patient. I don't think these patients have any other doctor that really knows them to the level that that they need, including their primary care doctor, including their neurosurgeon. I, I really think that that's a unique quality in uh, being a spinal cord injury medicine doc. So what what is something that people don't expect that you manage for these patients? Yeah, you, that is a fantastic point because spinal cord is very misunderstood so our primary care friends who are the most helpful gosh thank internal medicine family medicine primary care um, for existing because they have an extremely challenging job but they might not know all the intricacies and nuances of spinal cord injury management so i think what is surprising about what you manage is just the breadth of body systems the the surprising part is that it's everything is affected. Uh, I think the other thing, maybe not medical, is the SCI physician needs to manage expectations. Expectations and patients, um, 
like mental well-being because when you meet a patient and they said yeah I was told I'm an incomplete spinal cord injury and I'm probably gonna walk again and then you do the exam and it turns out there may have been a mistake made um, it is difficult to manage how that patient feels mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so from a you know a non-medical standpoint expectations and, and mood not just like their mental health but their mood so trying to balance realistic expectations and their goals is is a challenge but it's it's an exciting challenge because then you can build a, a build a strong patient physician relationship um, but you you are right SCI physicians do manage what appears to be a lot of primary care um, components what about the inverse of what you just described do you how often do you encounter people who have incredibly low expectations and they end up you know being surpassed and stuff yeah um, it does happen especially if if they received some misinformation right if they were told you are a complete spinal cord injury and then we perform the exam and they are not complete then their prognosis for um, I mean the thing everyone in seems to worry about the most is walking then their then their prognosis for walking would be way higher they might be thinking well I'm never gonna move again I'm never gonna have a meaningful sexual relationship again but then then they get into rehab and they start seeing improvements and we start de-accessorizing them so to say taking out their trach and their peg and, and different tubes they don't want in them and then teach them about spinal cord injury yeah I think patients go from potentially a doom and gloom situation to wait a second there are folks just like me who are happy and healthy and thriving. So yeah, it does it does happen. And those are the things like when we talked about before, that's what's rewarding when you when a patient has the worst expectations and just explaining to them the basics of medicine in their spinal cord injury, they can sometimes realize that there is hope to get some level of, of improvement and recovery. So you're a therapist too. You are a primary <laughs> care doctor. You're a urologist. You are a GI doctor. You're a wound care doctor. Like there's just so many things that spinal cord injury really covers. I remember on my rotation, I was doing a full review of systems for every single patient. So um, that's a very unique quality for, for what you do. And that's um, what's surprising. You asked like the surprising management. That is what's surprising is mm. that you have to cover all those things. You know, you, you have to or else bad outcomes are just around the corner. Yeah, and I don't think any other physician that they see would take the time to to go through all that with them because it affects their function ultimately. So it's nice that they have that relationship with you. Where do you see yourself in, let's say, 10 years? What are your aspirations for your career? I think I'm most interested in inpatient medicine, um, and I would like to work at an academic institution I enjoy teaching I enjoy having access to research opportunities and then not so much the research itself but the repercussions of the research like the new interventions the new treatment options um, don't always make it to the non-academic centers as quickly so probably academic medicine primarily inpatient based I do uh, enjoy spasticity management including intrathecal baclofen pumps so I would like to have a, um, a Baclofen pump management clinic, and then as far as what outpatient and chronic management I like, I would I would prefer to to take care of you know my own patients, meaning the patients I saw inpatient, and I'll be their spinal cord physician until we part ways. I would like to focus more on the inpatient side of things. Um, at some point in my career, I think um, like acute care spinal cord injury consults is something I'm interested in. I don't know when or at what stage, but uh, I think the move to have PM&R involved in spinal cord injury care like day one is a really exciting opportunity because like we just discussed, PM&R might know the most about spinal cord injury and having them around to make acute care management decisions I think is imperative because it can hopefully improve their outcomes but most importantly is prevent negative outcomes prevent the DVT PE, prevent the stage four sacral, sacral wound um, so that they are 
optimized when they get to inpatient rehab. So out of all the stuff that you do and all the things you're interested in, um, do you have time for anything else? Like what do you do like in your personal life for fun that's not related to, to your career at all? So so in fellowship, shameless plug for Kessler this time, uh, <laughs> no, no call, I don't work weekends, we don't work any major holidays as fellows. I have a folk fellow, uh, Dr. Shelly Sia, who is awesome. Um, so, you know, we have appreciated the benefits of fellowship so that there is time. Um, like at Kessler, it's a busy day when you're working, when you're in the building, you're working hard. On the weekends, I, I live in Jersey City with my fiance. We have been able to um, go to uh, Asbury Park and the Jersey Shore. We've been to New York City and gone to m multiple restaurants with outdoor dining. And so, um, you know, there, there are definitely probably more opportunities now to enjoy um, my hobbies and our hobbies than I had in residency. And I love how you said our hobbies. I like that. It's a shared. Thing. Not your <laughs> hobbies, it's shared. Yeah. That's key. That's key to a good relationship. <laughs> we like that. So Dr. Lopez, you are a DO. So yeah. given that you're on the AOC PNR podcast, we have to ask. So how do you apply the principles of osteopathic medicine into your field? So in spinal cord medicine, um, there are definitely opportunities. So the biggest, one of the biggest musculoskeletal impairments that SCI patients get is shoulder dysfunction from chronic long-term wheelchair use and transfers. So um, treating somatic dysfunction in the upper thoracic cervical region and shoulders is an opportunity to not only improve a patient's quality of life, but potentially improve how they interact with their mobility device, with their wheelchair. Um, Kessler has recently started a osteopathic treatment, like an OMT clinic for SCI patients. Wow. Uh, and that's focused mainly on, like I said, upper like shoulders, thoracic, and cervical. So that is a very opportunistic treatment modality for spinal cord patients rib dysfunction treatment is definitely an option not necessarily to make the patient feel be um, physically feel better but to improve their respiratory function um, and no i don't have any research that shows manipulation of the ribs improves outcomes in spinal cord patients but um, that those are kind of the two big opportunities but it sounds kind of similar to um you know with the high level injuries how they have to use kind of a cough assisted device and okay. kind of like freeing up the ribs to be able to do that i mean it makes sense to me and the I, application I, of of omm there i think osteopathic physicians have a, a great opportunity in in spinal cord i mean in pmnr in general right you have exam skills that you may not have learned otherwise and i think PM&R and osteopathic physicians go very well together. So if, if Kessler is implementing like OMT and stuff, uh, and you said, you know, you don't have the research to show it, but this sounds like, like a good research opportunity, I guess. Is this something um, that is being researched? I am meeting with Dr. Kurtzlum next week to discuss research, and that is on the list for sure. I mean, I, I would be interested to see, and I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud, like what does, how does respiratory function change if you've appropriately treated the thoracic and, and rib dysfunctions. And and if you have that kind of evidence, there's just more of a reason to implement that across the, across the board. Any any last minute advice for any resident applying fellowship or just students um, interested in the field in general? Yeah, I think for like people applying to PM&R, um, don't get, we've touched on this, like don't get caught up in the names Go where you want to go, like experience a location you want to experience. Go to the place that's going to give you the best opportunities for you. Like, don't worry about what your family member thinks of the name an institution carries. It just be true to yourself when you're applying to residency and making your rank list. Uh, as far as fellowship, particularly in SCI, like just be the best person you can be. Letters of recommendation are really important. As, um, as someone now now being in fellowship and starting the interview process, Dr. Kirschblum and the, the Kessler attendings have asked myself and Dr. Sia, the other resident, I mean the other SCI fellow, to partake in the spinal cord injury interviews. As the further you progress, the less the numbers matter. They are still important. Make sure you study and take your boards and, and, and do well, but what people think of you 
is what is most important. So be a great person and work hard. It, it's funny because when you are going through residency and a busy inpatient service in PM&R, time seems to go so slow. But when yes. you look back on it, snap of a finger, it's done, it's gone. And if you didn't take a step back and appreciate it, you know, you're going to miss opportunities and you're going to miss learning opportunities to make yourself a better physician in person. So yeah, for- life goes pretty fast. You got to take the time to stop. I believe that's a Ferris Bueller quote. We should we should end on that note. <laughs> yeah, so take taking the time out of your day to just stop, reflect. Life goes by really fast. Do what you're passionate about is is what I'm getting at from what you're saying. Well, Dr. Lopez, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. It was really great to hear your journey and it was just so refreshing just to see your passion for this field. You certainly showed a side to SEI that you know, a lot of people don't really see. So how can our listeners follow your path and and get in touch with you? Yep, definitely. I appreciate both of you uh, inviting me, Dr. Davidoff and soon to be Dr. Iggett. I do appreciate you, you know, both inviting me, reaching out, I've really enjoyed it. But uh, to get a hold of me, I have um, a couple different ways. Email would be, um, my email address is jw.lopez at rutgers.edu. And probably the best way would be on um, my Twitter. I have a medical Twitter that is um, at Dr. J W Lopez. No spaces, no hyphens. Um, those would be two great ways to reach out, and I'd be happy to answer any questions people come up with or opinions about the application and the process for sure. Awesome, All right. Dr. Thank Lopez. You. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you. Yeah, definitely check him out, guys. I believe he's doing a lot of uh, great presentations coming up. So uh, definitely follow him on the social media platforms. Uh, If you're a resident pursuing fellowship or med student uh, wanting to learn more about various opportunities in PM&R in general, just subscribe to the AOC PM&R podcast so you can get notified about additional episodes. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, guys.